the Wilmington Library staff and Board of Trustees, I'd like to welcome you to an evening with Debbie Allen. Um, so we're excited. To, uh, our fall speaker series is coming close to a conclusion. Next week, we will have the Kims of Comedy. And then we will conclude with uh, Omari Hardwick. And then we'll, we'll retire and quit and leave. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the moderator of our conversation. Um, he's basically family, and we should put him on the payroll because he's been here so many times. Do you all remember the TV show, A Different World? Yeah. Do you remember Ron? Yeah. Well, Ron is here. Daryl Bell, come on out. Good evening, Delaware. How y'all doing? Jamar is telling the truth. I need to get a home here in Delaware. I keep coming back and there's more people every time I come back. It's like y'all knew something was gonna happen good. Well, we're in for a special evening tonight. It is rare. I've had the, the privilege as a host to interview lots of stars. I have not had the opportunity to interview I was like, there's music playing. It's like, I know my voice sounds good, but that's not, it's not quite that good, but okay. Uh, but rarely do I get the chance to interview one of my mentors, one of my sheroes, and a megastar who will never behave like one. That's just a fact. It's funny, somebody was saying to her backstage, I just can't believe I'm walking up to a legend. She said, honey, I'm just a working girl. <laughs> That's who she is. So let me, let me tell you, I know we, we, I have a lot of questions for her. I know we aren't going to get to most of them because she will have so many dimes to drop. I could take an hour just giving you her credentials. So fortunately, her assistant sent me her bio in short form <laughs> so I could break it down. Debbie Allen. A BFA graduate of Howard University, the Howard University, in theater and classical Greek studies. For the record, I did not know that. She holds five honorary doctorate degrees, has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, was named a Kennedy Center honoree, and is an award-winning director, choreographer, who has choreographed the Academy Awards a record 10 times. She has directed and choreographed for the legendary artists such as Michael Jackson, Mar Mariah Carey, James Earl Jones, her sister Felicia Rashad, Janet Jackson, Whitney Houston, Gwen Verdon, Leonard Horn, Sammy Davis Jr., Dolly Parton, Savion Glover, and most recently Tyler Perry's A Jazz Man's Blues. I'll go right ahead. Go right ahead. Ms. Allen received the Golden Globe for her role as Lydia Grant in the 1980s hit series, Fame. Because if you want fame, fame costs. And it starts right here. The Drama Desk Award for her portrayal of Anita in West Side Story and is a four-time Emmy Award winner in choreography for fame, twice. The Motown 25th and Christmas on the Square. She's also received an Emmy Award for outstanding movie made for television as executive producer and Debbie says, shut up, honey, let's go, come on. That list is too long. <laughs> I told you, and that's the short version. That's the short version. I said it. How you doing? I'm good. I just came from Howard University. They're starting homecoming, and um, the yard is just full of so much. There's great food stations and 
talent on the stage. And last night I was on at the Howard Theater with Jada Pinkett, her book, Worthy, something I think everybody ought to take a look at. I really am proud of her. And in the middle of all of that, um, you know, I'm here with you. And I'm here with you. <laughs> okay. So we can talk about all of your accomplishments, but I would like to start by saying, how did you start? What, what is, from, were you born in Houston, Texas? Mm -hmm. What inspired you and led you into the arts? I think I was dancing when I came out the womb. I think I was dancing child <laughs> when, 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 before I could even holler good or talk. And it was all about the dance for me. And as a little girl, um, growing up in Houston, Texas, where segregation was the way of life, there were the best dance schools that we couldn't go to. So mommy had to find us somewhere to go. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I think children can know at a very early age what they want to do. I wasn't even more than four, and I knew that's what I wanted to do. I was watching all the musical films. I wanted to replace that half of Shirley Temple. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wanted to go up and down those steps with Bill Robinson and... Then I saw all those wonderful musical films had a big influence on me. So it was no wonder that I became a director because I was paying attention. I was always paying attention. And so it was about getting the training. And mommy moved us to Mexico, and there I studied with the Ballet Nacional. And when I came back, the Houston Ballet finally opened their door to one black student, and it was me. And I was there. <laughs> I was there six months before the board knew they had a black student. <laughs> and they weren't happy. But when they saw me dance, they had to calm down. Come on, honey. I was out dancing those other half us. Come on. <laughs> and so it was just always there. So dance led me to everything, to theater, acting, the intellectual side of it, you know, the classics and the wonderful instructors I had at Howard University. So... Y'all may not know this, but Debbie is like a surrogate mother to everybody. We all call her mommy. But when you hear her talk about her mother, that's really mom. And when I think about everything you just said, the one thing that I know happened but you didn't talk about was they didn't want you. Why? Well, they who? It was a couple of groups that didn't want me to go over there. I mean, I couldn't go to the Ballet school when I was a kid. Mommy tried to pretend I was Mexican. They still wouldn't take me. <laughs> Days then, later on, uh, I got through the Houston Ballet Foundation. I went to audition for the North Carolina School of the Arts. They used me to audition, and the man told me that I wasn't right for dance. I should do something else. My body wasn't right. That. And it was devastating. Wow. And I went to Howard, which really was the best thing that happened. So sometimes things are supposed to happen that you don't even understand. You know? It was painful, but it was wonderful. I mean, I first day at Howard, I saw all those boys on the wall, and I was like, yes. <laughs> yes. But soon I started dancing, and I was being developed intellectually by great, great black scholars. And uh, then I got to Broadway, and my first big audition, the guy kept me to the end. And then he said to me, you know, you were, he, he, I was standing here, he went, okay, it was down to like eight of us. He said, okay, you, you, skipped over me, you, you, you. And then I went, hmm. And he said, uh, could I speak to you? I need to say something. And um, he said, you know what, you're really talented. You're going to do something in this, in this industry. He said, but I just don't need another brunette. I said, child, you can dye this. He said, go another color. <laughs> that same man, many years later, was a choreographer for me and Ben Vereen when we did his roots. And I was Ben's leading lady. So things happen. But I just want to take a moment and say hi to someone in this audience that I haven't really met, whose son is working with me now. I have a wonderful, brilliant young man, Joshua Nelson, who is my new executive assistant and helping me with development. And his mom and his grandmom, Thelma and Crystal Nelson, where y'all at? Where y'all at? Hey! 
I love your son. I want to say hi to you. It's so nice that you get to bring people along. He went to Howard University. He's brilliant. He's, a, he's going to do a lot of things. Anyway, I just had to say hi. See, I told you I wasn't going to get to have my questions. I told you. But, but what's interesting is how things repeat. So they didn't think you had the right body type. Didn't that happen to Vivian too, your daughter? Um, not really. No, because, you know, we weren't playing that, but we had a teacher that was Russian that was acting out by the time she got to the Kirov Academy. And there were only two black kids in that school. And the Russian man was just, Arr. so, you know, the Russians are tough. They have some of the best ballet. I mean, it's, if you're in the dance world, you can't be thin-skinned because it's born on criticism. Not enough, good enough, no. Again, 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 higher. And then they might go, okay, okay. They might give you a little compliment. But that's how they are. But this man went at Vivian's juggler child. He went and he told her one day that, you know, you'll never dance. You might as well go and audition for Alvin Ailey now. I'm like, like what? Like Alvin Ailey, they're not dancing? They had to hold me back. Hold me back. I was going at this. I said, child, you don't understand. I'm going to have Maxine Waters, Jesse Jackson, Colin Powell. I'm going to have, they're going to be on your doorstep. We're going to burn this school down. Y'all don't understand. I went to Howard, honey. We don't play this mess. No. So my husband had to go because I was too, I was, no. They couldn't let me go. And he apologized to her in front of the whole school. And the woman told me, he's, he's sick. I said, take him to the hospital. <laughs> so, but then out of that, Vivian, who had been at the Kirov Academy for two and a half years and had never called home to cry, I thought I wasn't a good mother. I thought she didn't miss me. She's like, Mommy, can I come home? And I started the Debbie Allen Dance Academy. I started it. And so... For my daughter, but for all the Vivians in our community. And I had a line down the street, I had over 500 kids auditioning. I didn't even have a scholarship. But we started, and now we're 22 years old. And still, it's good. So, we jumped ahead, but I'm, I'm going to follow this. 22 years old, and how many students? You mean over the years? Yeah. It Thousands. Yes, I don't know. That's what I, I, mean. I can't. I don't know. My, I have something I call Dada Diaspora, and those are my kids that have come through me and now out in the world, mm -hmm. and they are major choreographers, they're actors, they have their own nonprofits, some of them are in business, uh, some of them you'll know, they've had their own TV series, and then I have a whole bunch of little ones right now, the four and five-year-olds, and I was in there threatening their lives last week. <laughs> yes. I still teach them because I want to make sure they're getting it right. And when I'm there, they understand that Miss Allen is really here. It's not in name. I'm really there. And they go, Miss Allen, look at me, Skip. I'm like, okay, but you ain't on the beat, Natasha. <laughs> Natasha, what the hell? Spectacular. No one is safe. No one is safe. No, they're not safe. No one is safe. <laughs> so, I, I know for me, the first time that I ever saw you was on Good Times. Oh, my goodness. Now, Junkie many, fiance. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and I remember I was just so heartbroken because I, I, I didn't know what the little rubber thing was. And I didn't know. I was like, what is that? Because I was a kid. I didn't know anything about drugs. I was like, what is she doing? Uh, but that was, that was a role that I know so many of us remember. What was it like being on Good Times, which at the time was the biggest black show in the world? It was exciting. I was actually there visiting Ralph Carter, who was the young son, and he and I had been on Broadway together in a show, in a musical called Raisin, and that ad adaptation of Raisin in the Sun. And I was Benita, and he was the little boy. Anyway, so... I was sitting there waiting for him, and the casting director came out and saw me sitting there. And I guess they had gone through a lot of auditions, and they weren't finding what they were looking for. They weren't sure what they were looking for. And she looked at me and said, can you act? I said, yes, ma'am. Do you want to audition? I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and I went in there, and I got the part. It was like 
I walked in and then yes. there I was. And it was a two part episode. And it was so nice um, to be in, on that set with all of them. And I, Jimmy Walker just adored me. And we did a movie together after that. My mother said, that's enough. But um, <laughs> I had a fun time with him because he was like the hottest thing. Yes. And he was so silly. And uh, I just never paid him any mind. I think that's why he liked me because I was not all, I was never one to go like, hi, Jimmy, hi, child, please. Jimmy, go over there, honey. Go <laughs> over there. We were good friends. We're still good friends. Was that the first television role? Or was there something before that? It was the first one that people would remember. But before that, I had been a, a recurring artist on Captain Kangaroo. <laughs> I did not know this. This is so good. I would love to get those tapes because he was doing sketch comedy. Yes. He had me dress up like a circus showgirl and... He was wanting me to be on the show just when I was like, eh, I'm going over here, I gotta go to Hollywood. Anyway, um, but th that was kind of the first one. I mean, every time to this day when it comes on, if it comes on and Eddie Murphy's up, he calls me, you're on. He's always making fun of me. <laughs> you're on. I'm like, shut up. <laughs> shut up. So from good times to fame. Mm. It, uh, yeah, I told you we ain't gonna have time. I gotta, I gotta push it through, you through, right? Fast, fast forward. Fast there's forward. a lot in between there. Uh, but talk to me about fame. How? how oh that my God, stuff? fame was amazing. So I was. Um, thank oh, you. Yeah. I was in the movie Fame, and I was actually playing a senior student who was also the assistant to the teacher, and I was supposed to be the nemesis for Irene Cara. But by the time they got around to my number, they had a 10-hour movie that cut it, but they let me keep the dress. I said, okay. <laughs> then, a couple of years later, fame just became such a phenomenon. In the movie theaters, they decided to make it a TV show, and they wanted to know, they had a meeting with me to know if I would be the dance teacher. I said, really? And they said, well, it's not gonna be focused on you, it's gonna be focused on the kids. I said, that's okay. Uh, could I do the choreography? Because I'd already started choreographing at New York Shakespeare, Joseph Papp's Shakespeare Festival, and Woody King. I was, you know, doing theater pieces, had danced with uh, George Faison. And so I was more interested in the choreo. I said, I'll do it. And that turned into, it was like going to graduate school for like five or six years because it was on-the-job training because all the movies that I had paid attention to, I always paid attention, which is something I'm trying to teach young people. You know, they up there, they're so quick with the TikTok child, 30 seconds, they can't do nothing. That ain't going to, child, what you going to do? 30 seconds, so if I give you a ballet, you're going to be on a respirator because you're not really in shape. You know, so I was always paying attention because by then I had been on a, a couple of award shows, um, and I was always watching what the cameras were doing. So when I became the choreographer, I was able to choreograph with the camera in mind and do so many things because I had been to Mexico, I had trained with Alvin Ailey, I had trained with, uh, you know, George Faison. I had all these experiences uh, and I brought it all to fame. And so um, it was a natural progression for me to become a director. The crew was actually begging for me because sometimes the directors would go home because they didn't know how to shoot the dance. They'd do one or two shots. Okay, I said, oh, no, 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 honey. Mm -mm. We got a dolly shot. We got a head overhead shot. We got a this, that. I said, go on home, honey. Protect your job. I'll fix this. And they were happy about it. They were, it was, you know, there were quite a few that didn't know. There were some that really knew. Thomas Carter knew. Um, he was my buddy. Anyway, so I became a director on fame. I became a masterful choreographer on fame. I became a household name around the world. We went to Israel. We went to Spain. We went to London. We played Royal Albert Hall. Diane, Princess Di came to see us. Um, so we're doing a documentary about fame. That's and that's going to take a while, but we want to tell, you know, I'll be in the middle of that because I know all of it. And we should tell it, all of it. Mm -hmm. All of it. 
And wasn't there a revival of fame too? Didn't it come they back? tried, child, but I don't know what happened. You know, I don't know. I'm not gonna say because I wasn't in it. <laughs> Maybe something was missing. Yes. I'm not uh, gonna say that. I don't know, but you know, we were so close to redoing it again. Ellen Pompeo, who's my leading lady on Grey's Anatomy, and I love her. She's my buddy. We talk. Oh, we laugh all the time. Anyway. We, had a, we got all the way to getting the rights to doing fame again with me, with her producing, me doing all that. And then it got down, bogged down into distribution. It was stupid. We were ready to go. So it's still primed and ready to happen again. There's some shows in this world that should happen again. It needs another interpretation with another generation. It's like the classics. That's what makes it a classic is because it's relevant and it needs to be done again. You know, when you take Shakespeare's Othello, you can take them out of that classic garb, put them in clothes today, and you can tell that same story and make it more now, but it's still then, it's relevant, it's classic. So, fame, and there's another show we know that ought to be done again, too. We're gonna come to that. Okay. <laughs> So now I know you were you you became a director on Fame. Yes. So once you acquired the skill set, where did you want to go with being a director after Fame? I just wanted to do movies. That's all I wanted to do because I was doing film. We, that was back before they had all the computerized and all the yes. digital film technology. You would go in an editor's room. It might be the size of the stage, and they had bins of. Film. They would pull it. I didn't even know how they knew where anything was. They pull in. It was all done by hand. And he would be cussing. Why didn't he shoot a close up? I was learning all the time in the editing room is where I really became more masterful. I heard what was missing, why it wasn't working, or I helped them cut it to the beat. I was in the editing room because they didn't know how to cut it on the beat. Child dance on that work. Mm -mm. <laughs> anyway, so. Um, what was the question? Where, where, where you wanted to go with your directing oh, after fame? So I wanted to do movies. That's yeah. all I, I, I knew I was ready to be a movie director, a film director. Uh, but then I directed a show called Family Ties. And they, oh, Gary David Goldberg had me in there and he was, they were, Michael J. Fox is so sweet. And, um, you know, I came in with the sensibility of a film director. So I was doing different kind of shots. And I remember Gary said to me, you know, you know, we don't quite do that kind of shot on this show. I said, well, you should have the same director every week if you want the same shots. I said, but I'm here now, Ooh. so I'm going to do this, but I'll give you that, so you can, you can mess it up after I leave. And um, they, all, they got at least three Emmy nominations on that show that I directed. And so then they asked me to come and be principal director, one of, you know, they wanted to alternate me and one other person. And I was thinking about it, even though I hadn't wanted to do multi-camera, it was quick, it was fast, and it was fun. Then I got this call from Felicia and then Bill Cosby. And they said, he called Miss Trash, Miss Trash, get out your broom, you got to go fix it. Felicia had come to the set of A Different World, and yes. you all were not quite happy campers. Yes. And I had gone to Howard University. I knew this like the back of my hand, and I knew it, what was missing. It was like there was no hot sauce on the table. <laughs> you know, where y'all at? Where y'all at? Mm. So they offered me this, but then I sat down with Marcy, Carsey, and Tom. I said, okay, let me look at every episode. They said, you want to look at every episode? I said, yeah. I'm going to do it if I don't know what, you know, because I haven't been watching every episode. And I saw all that was missing. I said, okay, I'll do it. And then I was given complete control. I mean, complete. Nobody really knew. No, but let me just say this. I didn't go in there like that. I was given the authority to fire everybody. I'm like, ooh, no, child. That's not how you fix something. No. So I went in there. And I loved Susan Fales, who was the most brilliant head writer. head writer in the world. And there were some other great talents, Gina Prince Bythewood, Reggie Rock Bythewood. They married on that show. That's where they met each other. Mm -hmm. uh, Yvette Lee Bowser. 
Mm-hmm. Who did girl? What? So that, that's for everybody who saw the Woman King. That's Living Single. That's Gina Blythe. For everybody who watched Living Single, that's Yvette Bowser. Shots fired. Yeah. Yes. Shots fired. Anyway, so they all came out of that world of comedy. People don't even remember that they could write that. Anyway, so I went in there and I'm like, no, no, no. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to take all the bullets. And that's what I did. It was my job to go in. I felt what I learned from Gary David Goldberg is something that I brought, which was every time they do a table read, they'd open the floor and let the actors talk about what they felt. This was not happening. Y'all were being silenced and sit, like y'all didn't have a brain, didn't have nothing to say. I said, okay, we're gonna have this table, and let's hear what the actors, they went, the actors? I said, yes, the actors. Let's hear what they have. Well, I feel this and I feel that. I said, that's good, that's a good idea, okay. So then they would leave and then I would fight it out with the writers. I said, hey, you just got some free, wonderful food for thought that you need to pay attention to because we're not doing this show the way y'all doing it. We're not doing it like that anymore. I said, if either you're gonna write it or I'm gonna ad lib it in front of the cameras. So Susan was happy. There were a couple of people that, you know, we, we're not gonna name names. Uh, <laughs> that need to get locked up. Um, but it was really about me kind of bringing them together. That was the beauty of the show by what I did, was come there, bring them together, set you free. I'll never forget that first episode when the alarm went out and your hands went up there. It was so funny. You can't, ex- I, you won't get it now, but it, it was the funniest moment that ever happened. <laughs> oh, okay, so I'm, I'm going to tell you about the advocacy of Debbie Allen and why we all call her mama. First time I met Debbie was after she had gotten the call to come in, Kadeem's mother, Beth Ann Hardison, had called Debbie, and Debbie invited Kadeem to come to her house, where Debbie has everybody, where she holds court in her, in her kitchen. <laughs> and she will cook for you while she holds court. Serious business. And Kadeem said, can you bring Daryl? She said, sure. So we came over to her house, it was the three of us, we sat down at the time, I had been only a weekly player. I had to sign a different contract every week just to be on the show. And Debbie said, honey, you're not a series regular? I said, no. She said, oh, we're going to fix that. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep you. That was the first thing that Debbie made sure that I got a series contract. We needed to keep you. You and Kadeem together? Come on. So she did that. And by the way, there was, there was a scene where, in the first season, where Dwayne gets a best, he, he, he starts dating an older woman. And this is the first time they were going to bring on a best friend for Kadeem. And I had already been on this show, like, multiple times. But Marcy Carsey said, because this role was going to be substantive, they wanted to hold auditions. So the character went out in the breakdowns. Hat, glasses, mustache. Me! And I had to come back and audition for the role. And so after, and everybody came, Stoney Jackson, Blair Underwood, like everybody auditioned for this role. And then I was the last one to come in. And they said, it was me and Kadeem. And and after the audition, I said, okay, I'll be waiting for you outside to take you home because we live together. (laughs) So that that was my first interaction with them. And also... What, what Debbie is saying is 100% true. What changed about everything was she gave us agency. She, all, she gave us all a voice. And for the first time, they listened to us. And the scene that Debbie is talking about, that one of the scenes I was going to mention, was when Ron and Dwayne had a wake-up service. And we had to go into somebody's room and try to wake them up, and the alarm went off. When the alarm went off, I threw my hands up in the air like, I surrender. Police. And, and police, right? And Debbie just howled every time. So funny. It was so funny. Well, at the time, Dr. Alvin Poussant, who was the psychiatrist who was working on Cosby, gave a note that said, this looks like police culture, and we need to be mindful. And that's what, honey, it's funny. We're going to do that. <laughs> 
had to, we had to bring Dr. Poussin along. He was over at Harvard. Tell it how would the girls got dressed to go to class. Yes. We went gone in all slum, and he said, why are they always so dressed like a fashion show? I said, these are black women. Yes. Just get over yourself. Yes. Get over yourself. Get some hot sauce on your table, child. So, I'm going to give you two more that you will probably recognize, and if it weren't for Debbie, it wouldn't happen. The other one, there was a scene where Ron was looking out the window through some binoculars at some girl across the way, and Alvin Poussin said, what is Ron, a peeping Tom? Debbie said, honey, it's funny. We're going to keep doing it. <laughs> that got in. And the other one, my favorite, Dwayne, was she naked? <laughs> I did that as an ad lib, and they were not going to let me do it. And Debbie said, yes, they are. <laughs> So, so, so to be <laughs> substantive about, about it, um, <laughs> while you gave us agency, you also gave the show a voice that it didn't have before. Yeah. We didn't get to do, and you can talk about the challenges you had with the AIDS episode, with the political episode, with the domestic violence episode, all of which you had to fight for. They wouldn't let, let us do talk about it. Well, we had to do it because let's be real. Any country where the students are silent, the country's dead. And here we are in America, a black university, the black Harvard of the South, and they're not having a, an opinion. I mean, the first year I took over the show, let's think about all the things that had happened that year. They had Black Monday, the Wall Street had crashed, the uh, uh, space shuttle blew up. Yes. So many things happened, and y'all didn't address anything. No. Nothing, walk around with eggs. I'm like, child, what a boiled egg, a egg so it won't crack. I'm like, child, then no. <laughs> so when I got there, you know, again, I went to Howard University. And I was educated by some of the most brilliant black professors known to man and God, who had also been, you know, influenced by people like Alan Locke. You know, I had Eleanor Trailer, Olivia Taylor, uh, Frank Snowden, who wrote Blacks in Antiquity, that a book that really did an analysis of, of how they viewed us in antiquity. It wasn't black, but this. It was black and. Just when you translate things, one word can change the tone of what is being said. Anyway, so it was important, because how would we have taken over the university? We were the first one to take it over. And then we weren't thinking about dying we were in there talking about African studies, that we didn't want to just have a European education. We wanted to have these other, mm. Then we look up, and the parents were outside begging us to come in, bringing us food. We did party a little bit, I'm gonna tell the truth. <laughs> it was nice, but we were about something. But then a month or so later, Kent State took over and they killed those kids. The National Guard killed four students. And it was a shock that our own National Guard would kill students. That's the kind of stuff that happens in China, in America. Mm -mm. So when I got to different world, we had to address some of these things. So you all took over the A building. It wasn't about black studies. It was about the radio station. Yes. And then we did stuff about the political politics. I mean, you know, this was when Jesse Jackson was the first black viable candidate for presidency. And we invited him to come, and Jesse came, child, you know Jesse gonna go anywhere with his camera. Anyway. <laughs> Facts. And then AIDS. I mean, I lost half my dance company to AIDS from fame. It's hard for me to talk about it without wanting to cry. So there at my house, we're having a table read. And I would bring them over sometime and cook for them so we could stay family. I made them exercise. I did all kinds of things, just trying to keep them. <laughs> Shut up. That's damn sit-ups, boy, <laughs> uh, let me tell you. <laughs> just trying to keep them as a company, like a repertory True. company. This is yes. the play we tell telling this week. So nobody got too uppity. We at my house in that dance studio, and Magic Johnson made the statement to the press that he had been infected with the AIDS virus. Ooh. And I had never seen young black men cry like this. All of you, Sinbad, Kadeem, Shaka, Gary, everybody. And then we just were, my husband, who had been his teammate, we just were stunned. And I looked at Susan, I said, Susan, we have to address this. We have to do something about this. 
And so we wrote an AIDS episode. And you would have thought we were putting Jesus back on the cross. <laughs> I'm serious. You can't do this. You can't do that. We can't have, they, they didn't want to do it. You can't have, the advertisers were pulling out. They were pulling out because we were telling a story that might save lives. And this was about a young girl that had contracted AIDS from her football boyfriend. You know, we didn't get into all the, how he, we didn't get into all that. But this was, and I had Whoopi Goldberg come to play the teacher. She was my buddy, and she was going to win the Oscar that year. They didn't care. And Bill Cosby stood up for us. He said, all right, you're going to get to do it, but we won't advertise. I said, it's okay. Just let us do it, because we cannot not do it. So we did it. Couldn't advertise. It was the highest rated episode of the year. <laughs> Word of mouth. We didn't even have the internet. We didn't have that. But it got out. That's what we were doing. And that was when I discovered Jada Pinkett Smith. She auditioned for the part. And she was like a breath of fresh air. I said, oh, no, because there was no cure for AIDS at the time. It was a death sentence is what it was. I said, oh, no, mm -mm. we're not going to let you have this part, but you're going to be on the show. So I put her on the show, and we gave it to Tisha, Tisha Campbell. Yeah. And it was... Um, a very celebrated, and, and we saved lives because people started, you started to realize that black women and women were the most highly infected group. There were just so many down low brothers, let's just call it what it was, and that's okay, it's different now. People are not so closeted with their reality or their true, you know, identity, and it's, it's their business, it's nobody's business, but if they could be a little more forthcoming and we know what we're dealing with, it's more fair. But we saved a lot of lives. Now, I'm going to push this forward quickly in this way. The same way she gave me agency, Debbie also saw to it that Jasmine Guy directed, that Kadeem directed, that Michael Peters directed. Debbie, Debbie opened the door for so many black men and women to direct our show and allowed them to get into the DGA open doors for them at the same time doing all that. Now, while she was doing that, I'm gonna do this real fast because we're getting through it, she was also directing SWAT, The Proud Family, <laughs> Grace and Frankie, That's So Raven, Survivor's Remorse, Army Wives, Everybody Hates Chris, The Game, Girlfriends, All of Us, In the House, The Sin Bash Up, <laughs> doing all that. There are, there, there's a quick project I'm going to talk about because I know it is important because when you talk about all the projects you had to fight for, you had to fight to get Amistad done. Oh, my God. Amistad. Amistad took me 18 years to Damn. make. And that's when you know that something that is in your heart, it's like a child. It's like you're never going to give up on your children. I don't care how badly they act. You know, what they do wrong, if they slap somebody, whatever, they're always going to be your children. You're going to always love them. You're going to stand with them. So it took forever. I could get in everybody's office at any studio. They like that dancing Debbie. Come on, Debbie, what you got? I want to do the movie Amish. Um, what? Slave ship? What? Mutiny? Murder? Is there singing in it? It's like... <laughs> Where's the joke? <laughs> what, kill the white people? I mean, that's not gonna, that's not funny. Yes. Anyway, so I got in, but kicked out of everybody's office. And it took years and years and years, and then finally, Steven Spielberg made a movie called Schindler's List. And his son and my son were in the same class. And I took advantage of him. <laughs> I came to the to the fit, to class breakfast, <laughs> and I made some yellow grits. So they didn't know nothing about that. <laughs> Honey, he was in there scraping it, and then I didn't say anything to him then, but I got a meeting. They said, okay, you're gonna have five, maybe 10 minutes. I said, thank you, just, just get me in there. And I had prepared for so long. He was so riveted by the story, and he had adopted two black children. And he was a man whose heart 
I connected with immediately. I was in there for an hour because I had Lerone Bennett's Before the May Mayflower had been my Bible. I had done so much research, the Amasad Research Center, all the way to, I, all those years, and I, did, I could answer every question. He wanted to know what was an abolitionist, what was happening in Spain, what was happening in England. I could answer every question because I was a scholar on this project. And this project happened because I like books, because I went into the Howard University bookstore and picked up a book called Amistad. It was a collection of essays by black intellectuals, religious leaders, you know. And I wonder, why is it called Amistad? The, the first page, the preface, told the whole story of the Amistad mutiny Supreme Court case, acquitted, sent back to Africa. I wept when I read it because I was an avid student of history and no one ever told me that story. It wasn't in any book that I read coming up out of Texas or even in his, at Howard. And I was like, we have to make this a movie. I was determined to do it. And I just kept, I kept at it and I, was, I saw a light and I went in there and I knew we were going to make the movie, and we did, and it was a struggle because people came after us even when we did it. And then when we made the movie, they just wouldn't. Some people were worried that it would dethrone Schindler's List. He wasn't thinking about that. He was telling a story. He's a storyteller, and he's trying to tell stories that are real. And he said, I want to do this for my children. I was like, yes, and I'm going to do it for mine. So there we were, and we found Jaiman Hansu. He called me. This is how collaborative he was. He found Jaiman. Somebody said, Debbie. He said, Debbie, we were trying to find Singe, right? And he said, you've got to hurry up and come to the office. I said, what? He said, we might have him. He wouldn't even take the meeting until I got there because he wanted to make sure that I felt good about it too. I walked in that office. I looked, took one look at Jaiman. I went, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> We sat down in Stephen's office and he came in and he had on those big African bracelets, that shaved head, that beautiful smile. And he was very gentle and so powerful. I'm like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and we looked at, he walked out and Stephen looked at me and I went, <laughs> <laughs> So, I know I'm getting all girly right now. Yes, in the hell? Getting all girly talking about it. <laughs> I, just, I just asked the question. <laughs> so I just want to say, Steven Spielberg is my brother. Mm. He is my brother in the truest sense. Because we went down that road together and it wasn't easy. And they tried to go for him for it. They said all kinds of things. And we did it. And it, not only did we do the movie, but then he made it a point that it got in every library, in every university in America, to make sure. It's something, and I, someone asked you know, about young artists just starting out in the business and how to get started, what to expect. For someone as accomplished as Debbie, Emmy Awards, Kennedy Honors and all that, the fight never ends. No matter how good you are, or what level you're at, the f there's always a fight. And it's one of the things that if you, it, Debbie is a consummate fighter. Now, I'm, I'm going to, because we're running out of time, and I told you, all this, I might as well throw this out the window. <laughs> Most people in a career, if you get good times, you say, I did well. I was number one show, I did well. You get fame, iconic show. Change life. You're like, okay, you did it twice. But then you get a different world. You got another one. But then you get Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> Shonda Rhimes, if not the highest, one of the highest paid, most successful writers in the history of the medium. <laughs> 
how does executive producing and acting in Grey's Anatomy come to you? Okay, so um, Grey's Anatomy had already been on the year a few years. Mm -hmm. And um, Shonda Rhimes, very confidentially, her, her daughter was one of my dance students. And I actually purposefully didn't speak to Shonda. I just say hello and keep going because I wanted her to be able to be a parent like everybody else. I didn't want her to feel like anything else, bells and whistles were going off and nee, 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 nee. Mm -mm. So then one day, I finally got a call to what I want to do, Grey's Anatomy. I said, yes, child, before it goes off the air. <laughs> so I went over to do Grey's Anatomy and there was a lot of politics going on by then. It was like season seven, six or seven, something like that. But when I got there, all of a sudden, everybody calmed down because Patrick Dempsey loved me, Ellen Pompeo loved me. They would take orders, and I would say, Patrick, stop that. He started dancing, doing jeté, singing fame. I said, stop that, stop that, stop that. And I think what I brought to the set was a lot of joy. We just had a good time, and we did the work, and we were... I was always fast. I was fast not because I was trying to get it over with, but I always knew what I wanted. So I didn't have to do 10 takes. So you come to the set prepared, I'm ready, we're gonna go. I mean, that's how you have to be on a Tyler Perry set. Don't come up there, honey. Don't even show up if you are not ready. Cause he is, <laughs> and he knows what he wants. So I always knew what I wanted. And Patrick was, you got that? I don't have to do it again? I'm like, no, child, no, let's go. Ooh. Ooh. And so they were all happy, and we had a good time. Then I got invited to come again and again. And I actually was, you know, even though I'm a guest director, I still own a certain space. And I had one actor trying to tell the other actor what to do. I'm like, hey, hey, baby, don't, mm -mm, don't do that. Don't do that. That's my job. you got a problem. You talk to your director. You're going you're gonna to make this a bad experience for you and your fellow actor. She went, oh, and that was good. I wasn't trying to do anything but what I know to do, you know. So then she said, they called me in the office. I thought, ooh, I'm, what do I do now? <laughs> um, and I was just getting ready to do all these shows with Boz Lerman, all, everybody was there. I mean, there's so many great shows I was gonna do. And she says, Debbie, we want you to come in and become our executive producing director. I'm like, really? So the executive producing director is responsible for hiring all the directors. That's their job. They have to vet every script. They have the final, often final say in casting and try to keep it a happy place. And I thought about it and I said, she's asking me because she needs me to do this. And I'm not going to say no to Shonda Rhimes. So I said yes. And I didn't know it was going to become as much as it is. And it's been a blessing and the most rewarding. And I remember the day when she said, um, you know, Jesse needs a mama. I'm like, yeah, OK. <laughs> she wrote me in the show. I became Jesse's mama. Then they gave me cancer. I said, don't be trying to kill me. Don't start. Don't start this shit. <laughs> oh, that's spectacular. But it's, I've learned so much working with her, being right by her side many, many times. I actually visited the Bridgerton set, which is unbelievable. You'd be so proud to see over there in London, all the black people that are behind the scenes. You would, be, you would be so proud to see that. I was over there working with Tyler Perry. Tyler has a new movie that's gonna come out called Six Triple Eight. Tyler is stepping into some new territory where he belongs. It's, it's a movie that is about the black women who solved a huge problem. They sent like 800 of us over there thinking that we couldn't do it, and we did. It's let, uh, Kerry Washington is the lead. But when you hear about this movie, you gotta go see it. it. It's extraordinary. Anyway, so I've had the pleasure to be with her and learn a lot from her and 
for her to be guided by me. I brought in, it was before any of the Me Too stuff. I said, okay, 50% of my directors are gonna be women. I did that. And I have women that are directing now, big time. And then I brought in some black men. No black man had directed Grace. I'm child, what y'all doing over here? What's, what, what, what? Um, and then I had to look out because the most endangered uh, on the list is the talented young white boy. Because right now is, you know, there's some really talented white boys that need an opportunity. And they're not getting it. I, you just have to know. We have jumped in front of that line, rightfully so. But let's not leave everybody. Let's just bring it. So I'm bringing everybody. I hired the first um, transgender director, and nobody even knew it. We didn't, make, we didn't have to make any wave a flag because they were there because they were talented, not because they were trans. They just happened to be trans. But we opened that world. So it's a big responsibility. You just know it's a big responsibility that I don't take lightly. But in the meantime, I have my dance academy. I'm still the creative director for Mariah Carey. I'm developing a musical for Disney, developing another big movie. Can't talk about it yet, and you'll be hearing about it soon. It's gonna be big, it's gonna be fun, it's gonna be fun. Um, I feel blessed, I feel blessed, I feel blessed. And I just um, so wanna stay healthy. Mommy, my mom turned 100 this year. Can we celebrate it, Mommy? And my mom lives with me, and that is a blessing that I wake up to every day. And I'm running home to tonight. You got to know, I got to care up and get home. So on that note, we're going we're, we're gonna to open up a little Q&A, but I'm, I want to wrap this up. Because even though I didn't get to have my questions, I told you I wouldn't. <laughs> I love Debbie so much. I love you, Daryl. One of the things, and I, I met a gentleman who works in city government, a friend of mine who's a politician. And pol politics is very transactional. But some great advice he gave me a long time ago and said, you can tell the strength of any relationship by how quickly you can get that person on the phone. I've listed, and you've spent the better part of an hour listening to everything she's doing. There's never been a time when I've called Debbie Allen and she has not picked up the phone. No. <laughs> Ever. Usually the conversation will go, hey Deb, honey, put that down. Get that over there. Yes, Sarah, I'm listening. What time does he need a car? All right, I'll get that. Yeah. It's the conversation's like that because she's helping so many other folks. So I wanted to tell you that the last card that I had that I knew I'd get to when we talk about the time we spend here, you want to you make the time worthwhile. She hasn't seen the card. She's an actress. She's a director. She's a producer. She's a mother. She's a grandmother. She's all these things. But the value of spending the time with Debbie Allen is she's a teacher. Yeah. Yeah. You will learn something. <laughs> she spends all of her time giving back everything she's learned to everyone around her. In her school, in her work, with actors, with directors, with all of us. And she's done that with you. And please give her a round of applause for doing that with you. Debbie says she got to run, so let's give it up for Debbie Allen one again. She got to be on the floor. Thank you. Thank you. I love you guys. I love your son. Please, I'll come back. So I, I really wish I could spend a little more time, but I really do have to hair up and get back because I got to get to mom. And uh, I know you understand that. So this has been a blessing to be with you, and I want to come back because I want to visit your your art schools and your, see your kids dance and give a couple of scholarships for the summertime. So find me through Daryl. I'll find you. Okay.
Don't you touch me! Don't you touch me! Don't you touch me!